I'm Charlotte Osgood Tillman Roland Hagen. And I'd love to tell you the story of how Seventh-day Adventism came to the Osgood family. My grandparents lived in California, and my grandmother became a patient at the Glendale Adventist Hospital, called Glendale Sanitarium in those days. And she was there for about six to eight weeks. And um, at this time, my father was just a little tyke, probably seven, eight, or nine years old. And so his father would take him to the hospital to visit mother. And as soon as he had said, hello, mom, he kind of get lost. He enjoyed roaming over the cavernous uh, halls of the old sanitarium. And he actually found himself down in the kitchen. And believe it or not, the afternoon cook invited him into the kitchen, set him up on the table, and while the cook busied himself with his duties, he talked to this little boy about the Sabbath. And so it became a, um, a regular thing for my father, this little boy, to head down to the kitchen very soon after he got to the hospital. And um, this cook always invited him in, set him on the table, and continued talking to him about the Sabbath. And um, it made an impression on him. And he uh, went up and told his mother, Mother, do you know that the seventh day is the Sabbath? And she said, Sonny, don't worry your little head about it. Grandpa knows all the answers, and Grandpa is a Methodist minister, and, and he knows what's right. And so the little boy said, well, if Grandpa, who is a Methodist minister, doesn't keep Sabbath, okay, maybe. So, but he didn't forget this little bee that was put in his bonnet. And um, he went on, grew up, and got ready to get married. And he was getting ready to marry an Episcopalian girl. And uh, they had decided that they both should go to the same church. And he said, well, of course, I come from a Methodist family. And she, and I, I somewhat believe that way. And she said, and I love the Episcopalian Church. And uh, my father interjected, but he says, you know what? I don't think either one of them are right. The seventh day, Sabbath is the day that should be honored. And I feel strongly about it. Well, oh my. My mother said, Seventh-day Adventist. My mother's wash lady was a Seventh-day Adventist, and she kept always putting tracks back in the laundry when she sent it back to us, and we never looked at it. But he said, I just feel like that they have something there. Well, let's get it settled, she said. And he said, the only place that I know where a Seventh-day Adventist is beside Glendale, California, is Battle Creek, Michigan. And they were in Chicago at this time. So she said, well, go to Battle Creek. Let's find out about it. They went to Battle Creek. He got on a train. He went to Battle Creek, and he went to the post office. And he said, 
I want to find a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't remember who he was directed to, but they said, wonderful. Go back to Chicago. There's a man holding meetings in Chicago right now. He can tell you all about it. And they did. They went back, and Ira J. Woodman was holding evangelistic meetings. And my parents, they weren't, my, they weren't married yet. They became convinced, thoroughly convinced, that this was the right thing to do, and they were baptized into the South Side Chicago Church. And in the a few months previous, they had married. And um, uh, they became very active members in the little church. And um, my father, who was studying to be a doctor at Northwestern University, continued his medical studies. But he made it a point to go to prayer meeting. Coming home from prayer meeting one night, he said to his now pregnant wife, I am impressed that I would much, I feel I should save souls rather than persons or bodies, referring to his medical st studies. And um, this was quite a shock to the young bride. But the more the days went on, the more convinced he was that this was the way he wanted to go. And um, to make a long story short, he ended up eventually in Berrien Springs, where he studied for the ministry, and went on to be a, a pastor, an evangelist. Uh, he particularly loved evangelism, a church builder, an administrator and a writer. And he um, committed his whole life completely to, to the Lord. In fact, um, he wouldn't go to bed at night unless he had contacted one soul. And said something about their salvation. I can remember even when he was nearly 80 years old, I was visiting in the home, and it came 10 o'clock at night, and um, they were getting ready for bed. And he said to Mother, I haven't been out of the house all day. I haven't made a single contact. I guess I'll go buy some gasoline put gas in the car so that I can find somebody to make a contact with. And that was the way he lived. So this young couple came to Berrien Springs with four little children. And they lived in a little cabin, what they called the Grove. I don't know if it exists anymore or not, here on the campus of Berrien Springs. And he um, finished his course for the ministry and went on to serve the rest of his days for the Lord. Our home um, was um, naturally uh, a very religiously oriented home. My earliest recollection, er, recollections are of Bible stories and being taught to pray. And um, eventually the, the home composed, was composed of five children. 
and there, there was never any reason under the sun not to have worship three times a day, morning, noon, and night. The house would have had to burn down to have said, skip it. In the morning, the children had their Sabbath school lesson. At noon, even though we were in school, we had to learn the morning watch from memory before we could go back to school for the afternoon session. In the evening, we had Spirit of Prophecy. And occasionally, we children especially loved it, when Dad would be home in the evening and he'd come into our room and have uh, bedtime, bedtime prayers with us. We loved that. So, um, <clears throat> and the home was also one of, um, there was no money, way no money. And partly because there were five children and partly because my father, during the years that we children were home, was um, stationed in Michigan and he had a large district. The many church buildings that my father DeWitt S. Osgood got involved with or oversaw um, all required money. These were Depression days, 1929 to 1935 that I'm talking about. And nobody had any money. And here we are, my parents, my father, building three or four little, little churches in the Michigan Conference. And um, each time he'd get up in church and make an appeal because he believed in paying as they went. And uh, so, a new, a, a new project would come up in the process of building a church, and he would say to the congregation, well, we, it's time to put in the plumbing. It's time to put in the lighting. Uh, I'll give $10. What will you give? Something on that order and get pledges from the church. And um, when I'm about 12 or 13 years old and I'm walking on the pavement because I have no soles in my shoes, I, such an occasion arose. And um, I had spoken to my father about needing new shoes. And I'm about uh, uh, becoming a little bit vain and and my appearance is becoming important about that age. And uh, I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm walking on the pavement. And um, <clears throat> he makes a pledge at church. And there goes the possibility of new shoes for me. And I'm very unhappy about it. And when I get home, and I see my father, I stick my foot up in his face and I remind him of my shoeless condition. And he raises up and he says to me, don't you ever tell me what I can give to the Lord. And I never did. <laughs> But, um, and so we children were taught sacrificial giving all our lives. We all have never felt 
I mean, there's been a, a generous heart in all of us as we grew older because we saw it in our parents. Um, the, uh, we moved about a, quite a bit. Um, and that was hard on us because in those days they didn't consider the time of the year that they moved a minister. They moved him when it was convenient for the conference, not considering the children's uh, concerns. And so invariably we moved in the middle of the school year and it was hard on us children, but we all managed to finish school some way. Some way. Um, we spent no money on clothes or anything like that in those days. Everything was made or hand-me-downs or given to us. And um, I got ready to go to college and I was <clears throat> canvassing that summer to earn some money for my tuition. And it came on to a fire sale in Des Moines. It was a, a dress store holding a fire sale. And I went in thinking, I'll buy a dress. I'm going to college. I need a new dress. And I was looking over the dresses and the clerk came up to me and she says, and what size are you? Size, I didn't know clothes came in sizes. I'd never had a new dress. Everything had been cut down from somebody else's castaway, and I bought my first dress when I went away to college. And when my mother discovered that I had bought a dress, she hit the ceiling. We can't afford that. How, how, how could you think of such a thing as buying a dress? And so that's just a kind of a typical way we counted pennies in those days. <laughs> All of us children finished school and went on it with our lives. And we're all happy that we were born into a Seventh-day Adventist family. But I would like to mention again, uh, my father, DeWitt Osgood, when he was first uh, converted, and he was converted, the first person he went to was his brother, Condi. And he, he, he just was on fire for the Lord. And he took the message to his brother, Condi. Condi raised his family in the Adventist faith. And to this day, we're all so grateful for the Seventh-day Adventist faith that we love and cherish, and we're looking forward to the Lord's coming very soon.